Today's guest is author and hiker, Aspen Mattis. Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living, an adventure podcast presented by REI Co-op, the brand who helps get you outside through gear, classes, and adventures. We talk to experts who have taken a wild idea and made it a reality so you can too. From people who have climbed the tallest peaks, started thriving businesses, and even broken records, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. I'm your host, Shelby Stanger, and I hope you enjoy the show. Just a quick editor's note before we start, this episode contains references to sexual violence and may not be suitable for all audiences. Aspen Mattis is the author of the international bestseller, Girl in the Woods, which was published in 2015 by HarperCollins. After being raped on her second night of college, Aspen dropped out of school. She was depressed and shocked her school didn't believe or protect her, so she sought solace by hiking the 2,000-mile Pacific Crest Trail from Mexico to Canada. The book has been praised by the likes of Lena Dunham, of Girls, Oprah Magazine, and so many more, including me. I couldn't put this book down, and I'm a big fan of authors whose works I can read in a single sitting. I just love her story and how fearlessly she shares her most vulnerable moments. So we talk about the trail, the magic of the trail, and its healing power. We also dive into gear, what she had hiking the trail, and what to have now, especially if you want to go lightweight. We also discuss writing her first book, the response it's gained, and she even tells us what she's working on now, which is the first time she shared this information. I love this conversation. Enjoy. Aspen, welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living. When I found your book at a library, actually, my uh, fiance found it. And we both read it, and it was one of the bravest books I've ever read, and I'm so glad we discovered it. So thank you for your work in the world. Before we begin, can you just give listeners a little background of what the book is about so I don't totally give it away? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me on. The book is about, it begins with, on my second day of my freshman year of college, before classes had begun, um, before I'd even removed my colorful construction paper name tag from my dorm room door, I was raped by another freshman at the college. And I reported the rape to the school, and we actually had an internal hearing, kind of like a kangaroo court type hearing. And the college found my rapist to be innocent. And I was pretty upset and I was I was kind of in this uncomfortable position of being at a small school with, you know, only about 2,000 kids and seeing him all the time on campus. And I decided that it wasn't a place for me to remain. And I ended up dropping out and leaving. And I decided that I was going to try to physically, literally reclaim my body. And the way that I was going to do this was by walking from Mexico all the way to Canada through California and Oregon and Washington state through wilderness following a continuous wilderness footpath called the Pacific Crest Trail that I had hiked little parts of and knew about, but had never imagined through hiking at 19. Wow. So Aspen, first of all, confronting a rapist is incredibly brave. And I'm sorry all that happened. And you've you've talked about it very openly in your book and on a lot of other podcasts. And I really appreciate it. And I want to talk more about it. But I'm really curious, first, why the Pacific Crest Trail? That's such a good question. Um, and I guess there's a short answer and there's a more complex answer. So the, the short answer is just that so I, I've been backpacking ever since I was little. My parents are both hikers and they both were rock climbers and they would take us every summer backpacking in the woods and in all different sorts of places. Like my, my grandma lived in Colorado, so sometimes we would use her, their little ranch house in Colorado as a base camp and we'd end up, you know, hiking in the Rockies and sometimes we hiked in the Wind River Range in Wyoming. And I just remembered those experiences of feeling like with my mom and my dad and my 
my brother and all like kind of huddled in the tent and my dad telling stories in the tent and my dad catching fish and my mom frying the fish. I felt like we were this little wild tribe in the woods. And I felt like almost like, like, like my best, like almost ironically safest feeling ever in my life was in the, in the wilderness with, with my family. And I guess the Pacific pressure became my, my stand in for wilderness, like, like a way to be in the wild for a long time. And that's kind of like the deeper psychological reason, but the literal way that I, I chose the Pacific Coast Trail is, is pretty just um, practical, which is that um, it's 2,650 miles long. So if you, if you through hike it, which means, which means if you hike the entire length of the trail in one continuous walk, it takes just under six months, usually about five and a half months. And that seems like enough time. I mean, like, it seems like if you can survive in the wilderness for half a year and do that alone, you're going to grow and you're going to become something other than what you were. And I really found that to be the case. Like I was forced into situations again and again where I had to prove my strength to myself. And I really, in that way, kind of earned my own respect. And I had to trust my legs that they would carry me. And by trusting them, they grew strong. And it became this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy of, of growth and, and really of discovery of my own power in a really exciting way. So the way I found the PCT was because when I was 15, my oldest brother and his wife, who are also backpackers, thanks to our upbringing, they hiked the John Muir Trail, which is about, I think, 211 miles through the High Sierra Mountains. And that trail overlaps with the Pacific Crest Trail for about 200 of those 211 miles. So it's almost entirely a little segment of the Pacific Crest Trail. And so they had done that hike when I was 15. I learned about the John Muir Trail that way. So when I was 17, and I, I actually solo backpacked the John Muir Trail. So I hiked those 211, actually 220 miles with the, with the ascent hike to the summit of Mount Whitney. Wow. I, I hiked those miles alone when I was 17. And so on that hike, I met a man who was southbounding, hiking the PCT from Canada to Mexico instead of Mexico to Canada. What did you say? Sorry, what did you say that word was? He was... Southbounding. So they call you either... Nobo or Sobo. Nobo means you're hiking from, you're northbound. You're hiking from Mexico toward Canada. And Sobo is okay, southbound. Okay, Got it, got it. Okay, sorry. Southbound. It's, sorry, I'm sorry. That's, that's definite through hiker lingo. No, like, that's great. Lingo. I'm going to ask you no some through hiker lingo <laughs> on this show because I, I learned more about through hiking through your book than any book I've ever read on hiking. So keep going. So so he you he was southbounding in you met this guy. He, he was like from Italy and he was emaciated and he had come all the way to America to southbound the Pacific Crest Trail the whole length. And I, I just remember just a brief exchange. Like we might've talked for like two minutes. I think it was in Red's Meadow in the High Sierra. And he told me basically that people do this and that this is a thing. And he was pretty uncommon going southbound, but um, many people started to, at the Mexican border in late April and they northbound because the weather window just makes a lot more sense yep. to do it that way. But I guess with his schedule, um, southbounding was the only option. So yeah, was, I was just heard about, like, I heard about this, this continuous footpath through the wilderness all the way from Mexico to Canada, this unbreaking path. And it was just, it sounded so magical. And so impossible and and I kind of vaguely like noted like I want to do that someday and I didn't think that that day would be in just two years I thought it would be like maybe if I lost my job someday yeah so you decided to do this though at a time when you were really vulnerable and you kind of just said f it I'm gonna do this why did you decide to do it I mean, you'd already done it alone, but alone 200 miles versus 2,000 miles is 
different. Right. And so that's, that's such a good question because so many people said to me, like being alone in the, in the wilderness as a young woman is the most dangerous possible situation to put yourself in, especially after a rape. And I knew from my own experience that when I hiked the John Muir Trail, I hardly had any, I didn't have any negative interactions with any people. It was like friendly backpackers and it felt extremely safe. And I, I had such positive emotional associations with hiking from, from my childhood and from, from that long hike when I was 17. But then what I really didn't think through or foresee was that they were kind of right in that about 400 people attempt to through hike the Pacific Crest Trail each year, or at least when I hiked, that was the case. And of those 400, about nine out of every 10 are men. So I really led college, which is about 50% female, 50% male, into the one place on earth, except for maybe the, the military, where men multiply and women divide, and really being a female is an extreme minority. And so kind of unwittingly, I put myself into this situation where I had no choice other than to express myself and make my boundaries known and clear whenever I was with a, a male through hiker alone. And what I found was that really when you tell someone you're not comfortable with something or when you say no to something, most people respect that. And people are basically good. And it really, this became sort of an unintentional kind of immersion therapy where again and again and again, I was, you know, alone with men or groups of young men. And again and again and again, I would just say what I was comfortable with. And again and again and again, people generally respected it. And um, until I kind of realized that rape is not normal, you know, that I was safe in the world in a way that I hadn't felt since before the rape. Was there any particular moments on the trail where you kind of realized that, where you realized you weren't to blame for what happened? A particular moment. I think, yeah, there, there was one that comes to mind, actually. Um, in general, I would say it was sort of a, a kind of a slow awakening to that realization, like really like I did not cause this, rapists cause rape, short shorts don't cause rape, weed doesn't cause rape, rapists cause rape, the sort of like this gradual thing I began to feel with clarity. But there was one experience, um, without giving too much to the book away, I, so often when you get to a, a, a road on the PCT where the trail crosses a road, you would hitchhike down that road into the nearest town and you go to the grocery store and you resupply, you get food and then you hitchhike back to the same point up the road, back to the same point on the trail where you got off and you continue your continuous footsteps along the trail. So you don't skip any of the trail hitchhiking, but you hitchhike to get to the town quite frequently. So usually about once every 100 miles or so, there's a road that goes to a town and you take it. And so in one case, I was already in the town. I was in the town of Etna, California, and I was trying to hitch a ride back to the trail. And it was a Sunday, and Etna is, is a, a kind of a sleepy town, and it's also sort of um, a church-dense town. So it's a fairly religious population. I think most people were in church or just weren't out. Um, and I stuck my thumb out, and you know, an hour passed and two hours passed and hardly any cars were passing, usually just those huge trucks occasionally. And I broke a rule that I had made myself, which was never to hitch a ride with a man who's alone. So I would do couples, you know, a man and a woman or families or groups of guys, but I wouldn't hitch with a man who was alone just because I, I felt like unsafe. But in this particular case, after three or so hours of, of waiting, um, a man in a truck pulled over, just a pickup truck, and I got in, 
And he, I asked him to take me to the trail, and instead he took me somewhere else. He took me to down this dirt road to his ranch. And I uncharacteristically became very assertive, and I was like, take me back to the effing trail, right effing out. And he did. And I realized two things, kind of. One is that in no world was what he did okay, and I wasn't asking for that. And, like, all these stories that are kind of, like, fed through the media, like, women should, you know, that women are responsible for men not raping them, kind of fell away. And I saw the kind of the absurdity of that narrative. And I saw it was just so clear that he had broken a trust even without ever physically touching me. And so, if you know, if that was a, a violation of my safety, then of course rape is. <laughs> and then the other thing that became clear that was really like inspiring to me at the time because I really hadn't been a very assertive person. If I made my boundaries known, they were strong. Like I said, basically in other language, like I am not okay with this. This is what you will do. And he did it. And I kind of discovered that like, wait, what did you say? And you can like, Oh, 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 I, well, so there were a few different exchanges, but ultimately the thing that got me back to the trail after a few unsuccessful kind of weaker statements was take me back to the effing trail, right? Effing now with, you know, the real, the real word. Yeah. And then he tried to convince me to get, he was like, how comfortable are you on the back of a motorcycle? And I was, I was like, I've never been on the back of a motorcycle and I'm not. <laughs> and he had driven me there in his truck and I just like looked at him and I said, the truck works. <laughs> The truck works. As I said it in a very just like, you know, there's no arguing with this way. And he drove me back. And I realized kind of then when you, like, rape does not fall from the sky like this random thing. It's not like, you know, I I appreciate the people who say something like, there's nothing you can do to decrease your chances of being assaulted. But really, that's a really disempowering story. It makes it seem like it's like this random almost like natural disaster. And in fact, like if you're black or drunk at a party, you're more likely to be raped black or drunk at a party. And that doesn't mean that it's okay to rape someone when they're black or drunk at a party. That means that it's kind of the opposite. It means that your safety is more within your power than you're told. Mm. And to me, that was really empowering to realize that like, I really did control my safety to a larger degree than I had believed. And once I knew that I could do that. Yeah. I think that you, you know, your words were really strong. You became really strong and you asserted yourself in a way that saved your life. Probably. Yeah, probably. And like, it's not that if he had done something terrible, it would have been my fault. Of course, that's also not the case. And I, I, I should make that distinction clear. It's that I had power in the situation. And if I believed that I had none, that I w- then I would have acted like I had none. So you talked about, you know, that was an experience sort of on the trail, but sort of off the trail. Oh, yeah. Every day you walked a marathon, which pretty much, right? You worked almost a marathon or a marathon a day, and you had to develop this physical strength. So how how much did this like developing physical strength sort of add to your mental strength? So yeah, so in order to hike the entire PCT in one continuous, they call it a season, but it's really more like two and a half seasons, you have to average definitely more than 20 miles a day, so probably like close to 25 or 26. And so um, that's what I did. And my, my average day was... Um, on the trail was probably about a marathon and my biggest day was 40 miles. That was in Washington. And wait, how many miles in Washington? 40. 40, 40 was my biggest day. In one day. Yeah. Damn, that's good. In one day. <laughs> um, and I could never have done that at the beginning. Like in the beginning, um, in the desert, when I started like a 20 mile day or a 22 mile day, it just felt like the absolute 
absolute maximum of my capability. And I, I found that as I hiked, I became just, you know, not only fitter, but mentally tougher and more able. It's sort of like it became walking or hiking became the new normal. And like, it was almost like walking for 20 miles was the same as sitting for the equivalent number of hours or, you know, it became like what my body was used to. And I, I realized that really your body can get used to just about anything. And it became really like, it's a strange thing to like be at your, your peak. I'm sure like as a surfer, you know, like to be at your peak physical fitness, it, it, it affects so much more than just your performance. Like physically it affects like the way you feel in your body. Like I felt like almost like more, more graceful than I'd ever felt. And just almost mm. like, like a small machine. Like I could really like, I could handle anything and like nothing like, Oh, 20 miles. I can do that in the first half of the day. You know, like everything became like, almost like I felt my, my, like myself fulfill on my physical potential. And then beyond that in a way that was just exciting. Like, it's like, what am I going to discover I can do next? Well, not only that, but you were developing strength in nature. So were there any, can you maybe just describe parts of the trail that you found magical or beautiful so we can just get a picture of it? Because mm. I've done a lot of podcasts this year about the healing power of nature. I mean, we even interviewed a woman who wrote a book called The Nature Fix that proves scientifically why nature is so good for your brain and your body and your emotional state. Yeah, I'd love for you to just take us to the trail for those who haven't been and, and maybe some of the most magical parts. Oh, yeah. So the PCT, it's it's just extraordinarily beautiful and so so diverse. Like there there are probably four or five different sorts of of trains. So first you go through this like this dark desert that's like hills of, of basically dust with little shrubs, and the sunsets are just absolutely spectacular. You can see for farther than you know I'd ever been able to see standing on the ground because at the top of a desert mountain or top of a desert hill, you can really see all the way to the, from the desert, you can see almost all the way to the Sierra and nearly to the, to the ocean, not quite, but it's just absolutely spectacular how the the hills unfold under themselves and how they kind of absorb light. Um, And at sunset, they almost become this kind of almost like, a black like almost like silhouetted and and the sky is just electric by comparison and so really I, I I didn't like the desert at first and I grew to love it I grew to really feel it's magic and it's like mystery and and there is one one spot again without giving away too much but one spot in the desert where something that actually feels like magic occurs and I won't give away what it is, but it's a place called Oriflam Mountain that actually sparks. The mountain itself sparks, and and there are these orbs of light at night, and they seem like magic. They seem almost like floating orbs of light of different color, and that was really spectacular and and like just exciting to see. But then I would say my favorite my favorite train is definitely mountains and the granite mountains of the high Sierra are spectacular. There are these just bright blue Alpine lakes that are just this clear, bright blue, the color, almost like a more intense sky. And they, the mountains reflect in them almost like a mirror because they're so still. There's like this magic, like double mountain, like this doubling of the entire scene as if the ground were a mirror. Do you see the sky and the peaks and the snow all in the water? And from a distance, that's always so beautiful when you descend to a lake like that. Wow. And yeah, the the waterfalls were gorgeous. Like Washington State was just, it was misty and filled with waterfalls and and often like rainbows of refracted light were caught in the waterfalls. There were so many rainbows in Washington and there were, there were mountain sheep. I loved those. 
and it just smelled like moss and like 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 rich soil and there were these beautiful alpine huckleberry fields in Washington that I would love to go back to. They were just like these rolling hills above hills, almost like above the mountains. It was like these kind of alpine ridgeline huckleberry patches. And you could just, you know, you could eat all the huckleberries you would ever want. This was in early September. Which had to have been really nice because I'm sure you're eating like packaged food most of the time. Yeah, yeah. Fresh food was the most exciting thing in the world. Like I would fantasize about watermelon. <laughs> That's what I always try and take with me on every hike, and it's like the most inconvenient food to take hiking because it's so heavy. It's like literally like the calorically the most like the most ridiculous food to take, but it makes so much sense that you would, you would take that. <laughs> I, I would have taken that. <laughs> So the whole book made me want to hike the Pacific Crest Trail, but I'm I'm on the desert side and I just don't like the desert side, but you just kind of opened up a whole new side of the desert side of the Pacific Crest Trail that I haven't thought about it. And, and I appreciate how beautifully you describe all of this. You know, in your book, you also taught me more about hiking the PCT than any guidebook because you threw in names like Trail Angel, Hiker Heaven. I, I learned so much about about you know through hiking from your book thank you it's such a compliment (laughs) yeah it was great it was better than a guidebook one I'm really curious there's got to be because your book way more hikers in 400 year especially more females now hiking the PCT than ever before wow thank you so I've, I've heard that that's the case and I think that's more the case because of wild by Cheryl Strayed then by then because it's by my book maybe it's a combination i i i know that you know her book was a wild bestseller and oprah um chose it as a book group book and then it became a, a an academy award nominated film so i think that that caused the surge more than my book which was was definitely you know it was a bestseller in canada and it was like critically acclaimed but not like as wildly popular um, but I think probably I've, I've heard from people who have said, who've like found me on Facebook and like messaged me or who have found my email address who said that they hiked the trail because of my memoir and it changed their life. And those are the messages that really like that made my, made my week. Like, but I do wonder like what, what the climate is like on the trail. Now. Well, someone said that the, the party, the kickoff party got canceled because there's just too many people. Yeah. Right. So yeah, there used to be, yeah, just for your, for your listeners, there used to be this party that was very cool. It was like, it just, you know, one day hike north of the Mexican border. Most hikers would start just about the same time from this party called kickoff. And because there are so many hikers now, they got rid of kickoff because they didn't want everyone starting at the exact same time. And there would be basically traffic jams at the start. But I can't imagine, honestly, that there continue to be traffic jams because, first of all, there's just so much space and people spread out to their own natural hiking pace. And second of all, many people who start, they, they, they drop off quite quickly. And I think especially if people are, are hiking with a romantic notion that it's going to be, you know, this empowering and transformative experience immediately, which it might be. It really might. And I... I wouldn't discourage anyone ever from through hiking, but it's also just really freaking hard, especially in the beginning. Yeah, it is. It is really hard. So any advice to people who, by the time this comes out, you know, people were going to be pretty well on their through hike if most people started in April. You know, any advice to people who want to hike the PCT or just go on a big through hike and any advice to those through hiking now? Like, like a couple of things I learned about were – one, you wear tennis shoes, not these like bulky hiking shoes. And oh, yeah. The, the fact that you just take Gatorade bottles instead of these like crazy, heavy, insulated bottles. I mean, these are really helpful things that you <laughs> talked about. So, any, any other advice or just great resources on or websites that people can check out? Oh, yeah. So, my advice would be if you're thinking about doing it, do it because it was just, I mean, it is just an extraordinary and transformative and challenging and horizon broadening and just exciting and fun experience that 
we're so lucky, you know, we're so lucky these long trails exist. And so, okay, so here's my advice for people who are thinking about through hiking who haven't yet been exposed to all of the different campus and schools of thought about gear. I would say go ultralight. And that just means I was ultralight and most hikers who successfully through hike the trail are ultralight. And what that means is you carry as little weight as you possibly can. Um, and the reason for this is one, because it's just better for your body. It's much harder to hike a marathon with 40 pounds on your back than it is to hike a marathon with 20 pounds on your back. It's much more, it's much more charming to hike a marathon with 20 pounds on your back than 40 pounds on your back as well. Oh, so those are the two reasons. One is because it's better for your body and the other is because you actually will enjoy it <laughs> and you won't be bent over and you'll actually get to look up and see the scenery and you won't be hobbling the whole way in, in pain. So, and it's very tempting to bring a lot of things that you don't need because you think that you might, what if I do need it? But really, like, I remember someone once said to me, ounces equal pounds and pounds equal pain. So all those little things that you think you might someday need on the trail that you'll probably never need, or you might have wanted once, they add up and they'll make your every single day a harder journey and not, not as fun an experience. So just trust yourself and go ultra light because it really is going ultra light is really about trusting yourself because they say you pack your fears. Yes. I love that you pack your fears. So tell me, tell me really quickly, what did your pack look like? It was only 20 pounds. Oh yeah. So my base weight was 11 pounds. So a base weight is without water or 11 and a half pounds. It's yeah. The weight of your backpack plus all of your gear without food and water. So what's in your backpack? Okay, so I had a, I had a, one of the ultralight Osprey backpacks. Cool. Um, and I had the Big Agnes Seed House 1. And then about halfway through the hike, I changed that into a Seed House 2. Um, tent. And, and that means that uh, that's the tent. Yeah. Um, and a Seed House 2 is, is just the two-person model of the same tent. And now I think the equivalent tent is the, is the Big Agnes I think it's called the firewall um the fire something the firelight the firewall something like that and basically just any ultralight tent or tarp is good i prefer to tent the difference between a tent and tarp is just that a tent has a bottom and the tarp doesn't and it, a tent is sealed i prefer to tent but if you want to go ultra ultra light you can you can just use a tarp any sleeping bag that's down and that weighs under one pound wow um there are many different brands that work what did you use? Oh gosh, I don't even remember the brand, but it was. Oh gosh, I, I can't remember the brand of my bag right now. But I remember it was a fourteen ounce bag. It was maroon. Uh, oh, oh, Western Mountaineering. Western Mountaineering. Okay, under one pound sleeping bag. That's amazing. And then just just a foam sleeping pad. One of the just you know the Thermarest foam sleeping pads are really the the lightest sleeping sleeping pads and they work just fine. All, the only point of a sleeping pad really is to insulate you from the ground. You don't need a big, heavy, fancy one. And so, okay, so sleeping bag, sleeping pad, tent, those are the big three. And then, of course, you need water bottles and, and we use usually Gatorade bottles because they're quite strong and durable and they're very light. And so you could just buy them in town, you know, you just buy Gatorade and then you refill those bottles. They have kind of wide tops, so they're easy to fill. But any kind of plastic water bottle works. I've seen people just use, you know, Dasani water bottles, and that works just fine. And then a filter hmm. or poles? So a filter, people use different things. The most popular thing right now that I've seen uh, for ultralight hikers is the UV filter. All mm. it is is this little metal bar, this very tiny little metal rod that you insert in your water and turn it on for, I think, a minute. And it's a UV light that kills Giardia. Um, and it kills all the different waterborne bacteria. Obviously, it doesn't remove silt or anything like that. But that stuff, I guess, isn't so harmful. I used nothing. I had, I had iodine in case of an emergency. But I just mostly drink the water. And I was inspired by an academic report I read 
um, about how Giardia is largely a myth in the Sierras and in the Western United States and the way that most people do get Giardia, which is this really terrible waterborne illness that makes you sick for about a month. The way that most people get it is actually by not sanitizing their hands properly after they go to the bathroom. And they have little um, particles of of feces under their fingernails that they can't see and that gets into their food and water and that's how they get it. And so I, I read this and I was inspired and I was like, you already have a myth. And, and I never got sick. So maybe it's a myth and maybe I, w- I wouldn't recommend that, but I don't know if I did. That's <laughs> brave. Wait, did you just take your Gatorade bottle though and put it in a stream? Yeah. So if it was a spring, I would just take it directly. You know, the springs are the cleanest, you know, they're from deep within the earth. If it was like a stream that, 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 you know, ran on the surface through like a field that had cow patties, I would definitely use my iodine. I, okay. I, I use my iodine sometimes. And iodine will just kill just about everything. You just don't want to consume it on a daily basis for six months. Got it. So I did have that as a, as a backup plan. And I did use it sometimes in the desert. And then I think eventually I stopped carrying it. Um, it- and I think I also had Aquamira at one point in the desert. Okay. So you have... Which your, is essentially chlorine. Your water, your filters. What about hiking poles? I, did, I didn't use poles, but I found many people loved poles and they swore by them. I would say about half of through hikers, maybe even a little bit more than half, probably used poles. And they just used like the ultralight. I can't remember what the material is called. Not titanium. Uh, what's it called? Carbon. Car- carbon fiber. Yeah. Yeah. Carbon. Carbon poles. Yeah. I don't like poles either. Really? Yeah. Me neither. I never, I, I have been occasionally people would be like, try them. You'll see. And then I would try them and I'd be like, still no. Yeah. I read <laughs> that you ran cross country. I ran cross country too. So I'm like used to just kind of running with nothing. Right. Right. And that's, that's the most important thing. So I'm so glad you said that. You need running shoes. If you use hiking boots, your feet will be destroyed. Your toenails will be black and they'll fall off because the fact is, even if you had the best fit hiking boots in the world, <clears throat> hiking boots are stiff and they're designed for ankle support and they're designed to be stiff. And the abrasion of that, you know, your foot rubbing against the stiff leather, or the stiff plastic for that many hours every single day will cause blisters and will cause pressure in whatever places that your foot, you know, kind of sticks out depending on the shape of your foot. But there's, there's really no way to use hiking boots and to not have either blisters or abrasions or to have toenails black and then fall off. And running shoes, they're, they're mesh, they're light, and they're designed for, for miles. They're designed to let your feet breathe. So trail running shoes, how many did you go through? I went, I think through five pairs, so about 500 miles per pair. And um, I used the Nike Triax 13, I think, which is just a, is a, you know, a cross country, you know, training shoe. It's the same shoe I used in high school, actually, nice. when I was training. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, um, I also think that trail running shoes are also great. They're kind of like a nice happy medium and as long as they're light and they're breathable because imagine like if you have you know an extra pound and a half on each foot that really adds up every time you take a step also it makes it a lot harder to go long distances with using with comfort yeah i've been using these ultras and altra they've been really great and um there's a lot of companies coming out with ultra like gear it's so cool did you cut your toothbrush off or what did you do about that um, so it's, you know, I actually don't remember. I, I don't think I did. Okay. Most people did. Many people did. They, they cut their toothbrush in half. So it's shorter and it weighs half as much, which makes total sense. So funny. And I don't remember doing that, but if I didn't do it, the reason I didn't was just because I, I didn't, I didn't like, you know, take the time to do it. It's a, it's a good idea. Why not? Yeah. What, <laughs> what's the food that you had like because hiker food's kind of gross, the the kind you get already mixed. Some yeah. Of it. What did oh you my do? God. Imagine you like vegetables and fresh foods. <laughs> you seem like you're healthy. You did yeah. cross country. Uh-huh. You're a runner. Most runners I know enjoy eating healthy. Yeah. So that was actually 
probably one of the hardest aspects of the trail for me, which is interesting. Like most people, I think, would say like not showering for a week at a time or like, you know, not having a bed, you know, would be the hardest part. But for me, like the repetitive and like just really you get sick of just about everything that you can carry. At least I did. Um, But there are kind of two ways to go with food. There are two options. One is you can decide what you're going to hike before the hike starts and package it in boxes. Like you could have, you know, freeze-dried dinners. You could have, you know, whatever things you think you might want. And you could mail them to the post offices, CO, the care of general delivery, to the little post offices in, in the towns along the trail. And so you could eat the things, you know, that are nutritionally balanced, that you've pre-planned. And I, I found that many like older couples, like recently retired couples did that and fewer young people did that. However, what I found, which was really kind of like in my like not planning immature way, very gratifying. <laughs> what I found was the people who had done that, they were so not wanting to eat the foods that they thought that they would be wanting to eat. And they ended up just buying the foods that they were craving and, you know, putting a lot of the food that they had mailed themselves in hiker boxes to give away to whoever needed it quite often. Because you can't really predict what your body's going to be craving months in advance. And, like, I never would have predicted some of the strange things that my body would be craving that it was basically telling me I need it. Like, and, like, so the, the obvious things to carry are, like, you know, like almonds and dried fruits and things you could you could make a pretty balanced diet just minus minus fresh foods but the things that you're craving might be totally not aligned with what you've packed and sometimes there's nothing you can do about that like you can't carry watermelon but there are some things you can like maybe like for me like I I I went through phases where I was really craving um I was really craving fat and I didn't expect that because I didn't eat a lot of fat in my diet normally. Like, like, so I was craving like cheese. Like I would eat like eight ounces of, of hard cheese in like one day. I was eating about 4,000 calories a day. Wow. And you didn't pack a stove. And I didn't. So I went stoveless. Thank you for mentioning that. I really recommend going stoveless. It's easier to carry enough calories and a stove and fuel and all that is a lot of extra weight. Though I did appreciate when I got more meals, even more, probably because of that. But yeah, I would say maybe about mm, less than half of through hikers go stoveless, but a significant number do. And, you know, because if you're, if you're bringing a stove, you're either eating a lot of pasta. I suppose you could bring like quinoa or something like that, but you'd have to carry a lot of fuel in order to cook it through. Or you're eating a lot of prepackaged, like, what are those called? Like mountain, yeah, you're you know, eating, those freeze-dried. Yeah, freeze-dried dinners. <laughs> what did you eat for dinner then? Like, like what's typical? Oh, yeah. I, well, the typical, let's see. So I went through so many phases with food, but a lot of nuts, a lot of cheese, a lot of wheat thin crackers. I became a big fan of triscuits and wheat thins. A lot of protein bars and, and granola bars of different types. Really, there was no differentiation, if I'm being honest, between what I ate for dinner and what I would eat throughout the day. A lot of peanut butter, a lot, sometimes Nutella, a lot of, (laughs) a lot of junk, honestly, a lot of like chips, whatever, whatever I saw at the gas station or at the small town grocery store when I was resupplying that just looked really appealing. I would, I would sometimes regret buying like, Sometimes I can't think of a good example, but I think one resupply, I bought like this off-brand Oreo. Like, it was like the store brand. Like, and I bought a lot of them because they were so cheap. And like the first like, you know, 10 cookies were good. But after that, like, it's just, I couldn't face them. They, like I, I would look at them and think of like my mouth being coated with wax. Like, oh, gnarly. Yeah. Like it, really like food is not the highlight of the PPP. However, like, Food in towns is glorious because of it. So maybe it is kind of like you think a lot about what you crave. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. When we come back, we'll hear more about how Aspen caught the attention of celebrities, some more stories about the trail and what she's working on now. So stick around through the end. 
This episode was brought to you by REI Co-op, a brand who not only gets you the gear you need to get outside, but helps you get out there and explore. Anytime I've had a big adventure, I've loaded up on gear at REI. I've always loved their inclusive approach and the fact that the store provides tons of education on and off their floor. I've taken lots of classes at REI from orienteering to rock climbing, even beginning backpacking and survival skills. They also have tons of experiences from safari in Tanzania to trekking in the Alps and backpacking trips to the Great Smoky Mountains. I've been a member since 1996, and I love partnering with them on the show this year. You can go to REI.com to check out the latest gear, classes, experiences, to find a store near you, and to read great stories about adventure and the outdoors. I don't want to give away your book, but like, I love when you talk about hiker heaven and these trail angels that like leave food for you. And oh, there's so many like interesting things that happen. And I'm sure it's even bigger on the PCT. So I'm really curious, you know, this book was really, the hike was incredibly brave. Writing a book about getting raped, you know, everything that happened before and after, writing about your family, and then hiking the PCT is brave. My guess is it opened some doors because I, I see pictures of you with like Lena Dunham of girls. And I think maybe I saw one of you and Jimmy Fallon, you know, what, what sort of doors opened after this book? Wow. Well, I, I want to say it's just about trail magic. Yeah. Like that was actually the highlight of the PCT. Like that was definitely without giving away too much. Like that was a hundred percent. I'm so glad that you mentioned that it was, it was like, strangers coming together and creating this most magical and supportive experience as if there were like thousands of people that you couldn't see, like watching you and applauding and creating like the perfect circumstance for you to feel like supported and like loved on this like pilgrimage because everyone was sort of on a pilgrimage of some kind. Mm. So thank you for mentioning trail magic. That, that was the most beautiful part of the trail for sure. So after the book, came out, I was totally astonished by how many, like, people who I admired either read the book and reached out to me or heard about the book and reached out to me and, um, and wanted to, to, to share it with their, um, their fans or the people who are listening to them. Lena, she reached out to me before the book even came, came out. I, I had met, just by chance, John Cameron Mitchell, who was one of the directors of Girls at a coffee shop where I wrote most of Girl in the Woods, Joe Coffee in the West Village. And he had shared my Modern Love essay, which ran in the New York Times, which was sort of like a distillation of the whole book mm. with Lena Dunham. And she loved it. And she wanted to meet me. And um, she invited me to the set of Girls. And... Of course, I, I went and we started to talk about she was interested at the time in playing me in a, a possible movie of the book I was writing of Girl in the Woods. And we became friends that way. And, and though the movie thing went in a different direction, she ended up writing her own story of her college date rape in her memoir. And she wrote to me when that came out saying that she said, thank you for making me brave enough to share my my own experience. And so that became really like, that was so, so cool. Cause she was a hero of mine and I, I loved, I loved girls and I had definitely, I was aware of her long before she was aware of me. So, but yeah, like I, I was just, I was so happy and excited when the book came out and I, I got to see that people were reading it and feeling it and, and touched by it. And I got to hear so many stories from people who I admired, who, um, who had had experiences that they felt they could open up about now and that they could share share with me. And I was saddened to learn like how many of my friends and how many people who who I admired who reached out had similar experiences of violation either in college or often in childhood. How this is an this kind of like silent, dark epidemic that's now now no longer as silent as it was when, when the book came out with the Me Too movement, but still like 
epidemic that, you know, it's so easy to think when something like a rape happens that, that you're alone and that you're like the only one and that is so not the case. And it's really the power in sharing for me of sharing my story was that I got to really feel and see the extent to which that is not the case. Mm. You said one out of four women will experience some sort of sexual assault in, in one of the podcasts you did. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've seen different statistics, but I've even seen one in four women will be sexually assaulted during their college education. And that to me is just like, it's like, it's both unfathomable and just like a symptom of something so much bigger than that fact. There's no other violent felony that isn't, taken seriously enough to to frequently result in a conviction. Only 3% of rapes end with a conviction. So 97% don't. So there was a website you recommended if if someone experiences this or someone listening, you know, has experienced sexual assault, that there was a a site or a a phone line, a hotline, RAIN. Yes. Yes. Oh, my gosh, yes. It's called, yeah, RAIN the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. They have a 24-hour free anonymous hotline where someone who is like compassionate and experienced and knowledgeable is available. Like anytime you can, you can tell them anything. And I remember when I called Rain, the woman, she was so kind and she stayed on the line for so long when she stayed on the line when I was just crying, like I wasn't even saying anything to her for most of it. And she, I remember she told me, I think I said it earlier, very kind of swallowed, but I'll say it slower. Um, She told me short shorts don't cause rape. Marijuana doesn't cause rape. Rapists cause rape. It's really that simple. This is not your fault. You didn't cause this. You know, it was exactly what I needed to hear. And like now, it it sounds so obvious. But at the time, it, it didn't feel obvious. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. To those of you listening, we'll have links in the show notes of where to find that, that site and that hotline. Aspen, what are you doing now? I'm so curious. <laughs> um, so right now, I'm actually, I'm so excited to share this because I haven't shared it um, publicly yet, I'm working on kind of the sequel to Girl in the Woods, and it's called Missing Person, and it's about um, my husband was a literal missing person mm. for a time, and and it's a, it's a book about really the experience of his vanishing and what happened, and kind of joining with his parents to try to to find him and and bonding with my my in-laws through that and then and then kind of the awakening that I experienced in the forced independence and solitude that I hadn't foreseen obviously when when I got married I definitely thought as as people do think that that we were going to be together forever what's the book called it's called Missing Person. Okay. And and so it really, it's kind of, it picks up pretty much where Girl in the Woods leaves off. And it's about the, the creative awakening I experienced in the wake of, of my husband's disappearance and also about what happened to him and, and the way that he disappeared and how people disappear in, in that particular way. And, mm. and it's also a really exciting story about like, creativity and and finding your calling and and about awakening i can't wait to read it um the <laughs> publisher has got to send me a copy i want to i want an early read of that that sounds awesome thank you because i'm sure that was also a really hard book to write are you are you teaching writing right now at one of the universities in new york so i i taught um writing at gotham writers workshop in new york and then i taught 
two seminars, breakout seminars at Columbia University, That's but not cool. writing, actually. Oh, um, interesting. They were about policy reform. We were trying to create a revised sexual violence response policy for all of the Ivy League institutions. Wow. And so I worked with with some representatives. It was so exciting. Representatives from each of the different Ivy League colleges. And basically, we discovered the issues with because there was no uniform policy. And some policies worked well in some ways, and some had some unforeseen consequences for the, you know, for the victim and some had some like unintended consequences for the accused and some seemed fair or unfair in different ways. And really what we were trying to do was come up with a policy that was both compassionate and effective Mm. and one that didn't leave, that left, you know, the accuser feeling also like that they had rights and that they weren't, you know, guilty until proven innocent, but also left the victim feeling safe because often, you know, the accused and the accuser were in classes together in the same dorm. Like I I was in the same dorm and lived in the same place as the boy who raped me. And that made it really difficult. (laughs) And so there were all these different things that worked in some policies and didn't work in others. And we were trying to come up with a policy that was effective and compassionate and really would change the culture on these campuses. And it was, it was a really wonderful experience to get to, to lead that. Yeah. Thank you for your work. That's, that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Aspen, I feel like I could talk to you for hours. You need to come to San Diego when you go to LA and have to meet with agents about your movie. Let me know. We'll take you surfing. I would love to. I will. I'm, I will. We ask all of our, our guests this. If you could go back and tell 15-year-old Aspen one thing, 15, what would you tell her? Be kind to your parents, which wow. doesn't sound very inspiring or exciting, but I think the immature phase is one that we have to go through and that all 15-year-olds must be in unless they're exceptional extraordinary and rare people but I think now I have so much more perspective on everything that was wonderful about my childhood and all the gifts that they gave me in terms of love for the wild and my dad is also a writer so the you know taking seriously my creativity like that's really extraordinary many Many parents really want their children to have security and that trumps all else. So every, every parent is, is really, I think, doing the best they can. And I think our parents generally only fail out of love, not out of malice. And like remembering that is hard, but it's also really the fruits are great of, of realizing that. And I think that's something I realized on the trail like my parents certainly I wanted them to be this way and I wanted them to do that and I really wanted them to to understand how I was feeling after the the rape but really like they were supportive in all the ways they knew how to be and I think our parents do their best so I would tell my 15 year old self realize that you know mom and dad are doing their best and they love you and remember always that they love you. Mm, that is great advice. And, and you know, you were really honest about your parents in your book. And I, I found that really refreshing. Yeah, it sounds like you have a great relationship <laughs> with them right now. So that's, that's awesome. You know, if you could throw any party, Aspen, who's coming? Like, what are we eating and drinking? And where are we? Wow. Any party? I would say... We are like all camped out together in, oh, I know where we are. So in the plateaus in Colorado, so these big, beautiful, like just green grass fields that are at 13,000 feet. They're just like above the mountains um, in Southern Colorado. And we're all, we've all, 
either hiked up there or driven up dirt roads and jeeps and we're all camped out and who's there let's see so obviously all of my my close friends like my friend Karina and all of my friends from from New York and writers and my friends from childhood I would say all of my friends from the PCT who I haven't seen in so long and then also all the writers who I've never gotten to meet who whose work I've loved, like Maggie Nelson, and definitely Cheryl Strain's obviously there. You're there, obviously. <laughs> and I'm going to give away something now, but my boyfriend's there, so my husband and I aren't together. <laughs> um, I mean, we kind of figured that, Aspen, um, but it's okay. It's still going to be a kick-ass <laughs> book. You, you decipher the mystery, so... Well, I'm glad you have a boyfriend. Okay, your boyfriend's there. What what sort of music are we listening to? Let's see. Well, if we're in the mountains, I think we should be listening to some, like, well, honestly, like, Bob Dylan. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Maybe some, like, Bruce Springsteen, too. <laughs> Love it. You know, if you could, we ask our, our guests always this last question. If you could fly an eco-friendly plane, you know, one that's good for the environment somehow, and it had one of those banners that, that flew around behind it with a message what's that message to the world right now i think that message would say humanity is one family or we are one family because right now i think uh, fractions are becoming smaller fractions are becoming smaller fractions both like internationally and within america like politically we're just not seeing that we all essentially want the same thing, which is the survival of humanity as a species and, you know, and love and connection. And we're our own worst enemy in so many ways when it comes to connecting with the people who have different perspectives of how to get there. We all really all want the same thing. So maybe it would say humanity, comma, one family. I love that. Aspen, it has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been so wonderful. And I can't wait to, to meet you in person in San Diego. Aspen Mattis, thank you so much for sharing your story with us, with our listeners and the world. Oh, I love your story. And I actually learned so much about gear. Thank you to REI for supporting this podcast and providing lightweight gear so we can all hike the PCT faster. Definitely check out Aspen's book, Girl in the Woods, and I can't wait for her next book. Aspen is donating 5% of all profits from her book, Girl in the Woods, to Rain R-A-I-N-N. It's the nation's largest anti-sexual violence organization. You can check them out at R-A-I-N-N dot org. So check them out. Check out Aspen's book. Thank you so much for writing so many great reviews on Apple Podcasts and iTunes. They actually help this podcast grow and allow me to interview amazing guests like Aspen every week. So we'll read one from Pliability Pro who wrote, I just fell mega in love with this entire podcast. Like I just kept listening and kept running. Get this podcast in your ears right this second. So thank you, Pliability Pro. That means a lot to me. Wherever you're listening to this podcast, don't forget, some of the best adventures often happen when you follow your wildest ideas. We have some amazing guests coming up, including Wim Hof. Stay tuned. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.